right, so I guess we can get started then. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Pat Bonney. Um, and on behalf of the, the AXA EMCR working group, it's a, you know, it's a pleasure to welcome you all to join into our June um, lunchtime seminar to discuss uh, citizen science research happening here in Australia. Um, before I begin, I just want to acknowledge the Aboriginal lands on which we're all gathering from today. Um, I'm coming to you from lovely Gunai Kurnai country in East Gippsland in Victoria, and would like to pay my respects to um, their elders past, present and emerging. And today is also Mabo Day, uh, commemorating the efforts by Eddie Mabo uh, in overturning the fiction that was Terra Nullia. So, I also want to acknowledge the rights of Indigenous peoples to their lands uh, and waters and thank them for their continued custodianship to this day. So for those who have not attended one of our lunchtime seminars before, and, and please do introduce yourself uh, in the chat. Um, the aim of the seminars is to bring together early and mid-career researchers investigating citizen science in Australia um, in a community of practice to discuss uh, various opportunities uh, and challenges about the research that we're all conducting. And so far we've heard from speakers um, uh, as it relates to citizen science and environmental policy, genomics research, uh, biodiversity monitoring, and the role of technology in supporting um, volunteer participation. And so the seminars are of course open to all those other, other people interested in better understanding what research is out there uh, and how citizen science is ultimately making a difference to science, uh, environments, and, and local communities. So the structure of the seminars, uh, they, they occur on every Thursday, of every, the first Thursday of every month, and begin with a presentation followed by a Q&A. Um, this is then followed by a, a facilitated discussion where we'll open up the conversation to you and hear from those attending. Um, we'd like to hear about the projects and research you're working on as well as what we can learn as a, as a community of practice. And we'd also like to invite you to contribute to the EMC, EMCR working group, uh, join in on the lunchtime seminar organizing team, get in touch if you'd like to present your, your work. Um, and we're also open to hearing other ideas that you might have on the activities of the EMCR working group. And today's presentation, I'm very excited about this. We'll be hearing from uh, Dr. Robin Gulliver uh, about applying citizen science to environmental advocacy research. Um, Robin is a researcher at the University of Queensland and multi award winning environmentalist writer and scholar um, who served on, as an organizer and leader of numerous local and national environmental organizations. Um, her research focuses on the antecedents and consequences of environmental and pro democracy activism. And one of her upcoming publications includes The Advocates, Civil Resistance Against Climate Change and the Psychology of Effective Activism. So with that, I would like to introduce Robin and um, uh, thank you all for coming today. Thank you, Pat. Shall I just screen share and get started? That sounds good. Thanks, Robin. Awesome, okay. There we go. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Robin Gulliver and today I'm very happy to be able to talk to you about the Campaign Explorer, which is a citizen science project which aims to capture data on Australian environmental movement groups, activities and uh, outcomes. So in the presentation, I'm going to talk about five general topics. The first one will be citizen science and social science. The second is the development of the project, highs and lows, uh, a brief overview of outputs, and then we'll lead to the questions for our post-presentation discussion. So first up, our first topic is citizen science and social science. So social science is a study of human society and the relationships among individuals within that society. It encompasses many different research fields like anthropology, linguistics, history, political science, and economics. So like any natural sciences, it can be driven by empirical research. And any social science which involves the acquisition and analysis of empirical data could be turned into a citizen science project. And there's a growing number of examples. So if one really popular application of citizen science in social sciences at the moment is with transcribing. Uh, the Smithsonian, up here there's an example of Smithsonian Institute, which has a project of transcribing old records related to women's roles in science. And Digivol has uh, lots of similar projects transcribing records from earlier researchers. 
Every Name Counts down there is a project which asks volunteers to transcribe records for an archive of victims uh, and survivors of National Socialism. And one new project, which I just found a week or two ago at, uh, funded at UQ, is actually monitoring digital marketing. So I'm not sure what this project will look like when it's uh, finished, but it's exciting that there's more applications of citizen science happening in the horizon. So what is the Campaign Explorer? So the Campaign Explorer is a large database of environmental groups, campaign outcomes, campaigns, and activist stories. The goal of it is to create an empirical model of the environmental movement, which can be used for investigating questions across a variety of social sciences, including primarily political science and sociology, but also other ones such as economics, for example. What do people do in sort of the, uh, the Campaign Explorer? Well, currently they can search for information on three components, is campaigns and their outcomes, environmental groups, or individual activist stories. Now, at the moment, these are a little bit complicated. We'll talk about that later. And it's kind of geared up to people who are already activists or who already know how the movement is structured. They find whatever information they can on groups, campaigns, or activist stories, and send it through to the website via a contact plugin form. Uh, I then check and upload this data into a database, and that is time consuming, and I'll also talk about that a bit later. So the project has three broad aims. The first of these is to advance our knowledge of environmental activism processes and outcomes. Then it is to act as an archive of archivist, uh, activism history, knowledge and achievements, and to help activists, policymakers and researchers work together to create rapid solutions to our environmental crisis. But how can we actually apply citizen science to environmental groups, activities and outcomes? Well, first we need to look at the data points which can be acquired and tracked through this project. Okay, so in this slide, I'll just explain both the structure of the environmental movement and the data that's collected for the Campaign Explorer. In this way, we can see how social science topics can map onto a citizen science project. So first we have a movement. Now, Boundaries of a movement, a social environmental movement, are very broad and hard to define, but we can work from a definition. So something is a movement if it is defined of three with three characteristics. First, composed of individuals with a shared identity and concern who interact in a network and they engage voluntarily in collective action. So the movement is composed of groups, big ones, little ones, small, uh, formal ones, informal ones, staff to volunteer, every kind of variety of any combination of two people under the sun. Um, you might recognize some of the names of these groups, or you might not. Now these groups, some of them, not all, engage in campaigns. Um, campaigns are an organized course of action to achieve a goal, and each campaign has three characteristics. Um, they have an issue, they have a target, and they have a goal. Some groups do lots of campaigns, some don't. Some campaigns have lots of groups, and some don't. And as part of a group and a campaign, these people involved in um, events or active actions or collective actions. They have a lot of names, okay? Now, these actions can be down here on the scale of, uh, actually, my, there it is, my mouth, down here on private pro-environmental behaviours, which might be things like recycling or planting a tree. Uh, at the other end, they can involve civil resistance, like blockades and sit-ins. And in some social movements, this action uh, can also involve violence. In the middle, we have what could be called advocacy. In my research, I use the Australian charity, the not-for-profits definition of advocacy, which is activities aimed at securing or opposing any change to a law, policy, or practice. Um, these can include writing to a politician, or they could be attending a rally, or they could be gluing yourself to a road. So throughout my research, I have looked for examples of where citizen science projects have been a type of advocacy action. Firstly, we have a database of 36,541 events scraped from Facebook. And in that database, we found 73 events that were called citizen science events. So groups are doing citizen science, but not as frequently as other types of events. The other way these advocacy groups can do citizen science is in projects. Um, while the Campaign Explorer does not record projects yet, um, for reasons we'll get into later. Um, in the initial database, we did find out that the 497 groups do 208 projects between them. And um, these examples here indicate that some of them could be citizen science or they definitely are citizen science projects. 
So groups are clearly engaging in citizen science, but, oh, sorry about that. It's important to make a key distinction between engaging in it and using it for advocacy. So there's the act and the purpose of the act. Citizen science results have been used to inform advocacy many times, many examples, but I'm not sure if I found an example of citizen science itself being a form of advocacy. That's one of the questions I'd be keen to hear your thoughts on later um, after the presentation. Now I'm going to give a very brief overview about how the project developed. So stage one was data that I collected in my PhD. This involves scraping the websites of 497 groups involved in environmental advocacy in Australia in 2007. After scraping the websites, I did a content analysis, which came up with this information. Um, half the groups were actually in local areas, half of them focused on conservation related issues, uh, 83 groups primarily focused on climate change. And just in that sample, there were 961 campaigns. So there's a lot going on. And at this point, a seed of an idea was planted in my brain. That moved us into stage two. So stage two involved expansion of the data set and setting up a website. The expansion occurred when another group asked me to compile a database of all environmental groups that people could volunteer for. And it meant that I also included groups which don't fit the ACNC definition of advocacy. So this is lots of bush care groups and catchment groups and wildlife rescue groups, for example. I also started adding more campaigns from another project I was working on. And through a digital fellowship, I met a, a guy who told me that I could get a site hosted at UQ. Now we're up to stage three, which, um, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, involved another big change. And this primarily involved moving the site from an Amica S site at UQ onto WordPress. Um, and this, pro, this stage is very much still underway. Part of the problem is because with uh, Amica S, it has a very low interactiveness and of course, as most of you, all of you will know, any citizen science project has to have minimal barriers for involvement. So the tasks need to be clear, easy to follow, simple to understand, and the user experience of the site has to be really top notch. So that's why I transferred it over to WordPress. So I've alluded to a few of the challenges with the project so far, and that's the topic of our third session, which is the highs and the lows. I'm going to start with the lows. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing is, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with Amica S. It's a content management system on, on uh, websites and it's free. It's like WordPress, so it's publicly available. It's based on allowing museums and library connections to be uploaded online. And as such, it has a really um, complicated but great database structure where you can link things. So you can link groups to campaigns, campaigns to events in multiple different ways. So that is a fabulous, fabulous asset of Amica S. The problem is that that's the back and the front that people see uh, is totally different and they're just not user friendly. So this bit here, this picture here is um, related to one of the campaigns actually done by a group. And to me, it means a lot, but to other people, that's just, it's just not clear, right? So how we change it is you have to get in the back end I don't have access to the back end at UQ and the workarounds you can do through a JavaScript kind of module are really fickle and frustrating and almost bring me to tears. So that's a low. Another low is that transferring it to WordPress is um, that the plugins can't replicate that great database structure of Omega S yet without a whole lot of customization that I don't have the programming abilities to do. There's also over 50,000 records to transfer across and connect in that database. And even when just a few of them are up there, because they're linked onto a map, um, it makes the website really, really slow. And then the last low is that when it's all up on WordPress, you still have to do a lot of testing and streamlining and integrating, of course, and that's time consuming. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, when people put in their data, uh, I have to review it before uploading it. And so that takes time. And lastly, of course, most things can be solved with a bit of money, but uh, I do, this is a side project for me. So any grants and collaborations that I form are wonderful, but of course, the, what I, I, there's stuff that I do for environmental groups that will always have greater priority than this project, unfortunately. So it always makes it hard just to move it along. But let's go to the highs. 
Okay, the best thing about this project, I think, is just the amount of data it has and how rich that data is. A lot of the data is local. As mentioned before, half of the groups in stage one focus on local issues. So just like other citizen science projects where we get volunteers to help because there's not enough scientists out there with the time or the ability to get the data themselves, we can get all of this local, really granular data through volunteers. Most of the local activism that happens never goes recorded. So there's very little documentation of actual environmental activism in Australia. And so it's really unique data. It's also a great community of like-minded people. I'm sure you feel this with your projects as well, the people who really care about the same thing that you care about, and, um, and they just really motivate you to keep going. It's one step closer to my long-term goal, which is, as the pictures on the slide indicate, to create a dynamic, automatic model of the outcomes of campaigns, um, which requires massive amounts of data and quite a lot of tech skills, but this is one step closer. And lastly, there's been a whole lot of outputs that have been created from the data set so far. So I'll tell you about that briefly. Yeah. So this is um, one of the, a couple of the outputs we've had. On the left, the graph there, that data has been used for a couple of papers in a monograph. We see there the evolution of the environmental movement based on the data from the project. Um, from 1883 down here to 2019, this is the growth of these groups. Half of the groups, again, were focused on conservation, but we can see when climate change groups started, that's the orange, sort of around 2006. On the right is the graph showing the 35,000, 36,000 events we scraped off Facebook between 2010 and 2019. Now, even though the groups, um, the growth of those groups, of course, correspond to the growth of Facebook as a platform, we can still see that when we've grouped uh, these events into five different types, the most common type of event used by environmental advocacy groups is information sharing. That's things like um, having a public meeting or a candidates forum or film sharing. So that's kind of really informa interesting information as well. And that is going in this civil resistance monograph that's coming out later in the year. We've also looked at the outcomes of the of climate and conservation campaigns. On the left, we can see that all of the different types of conservation campaign here, sort of subcategories, if you look at development, well over half of campaigns focusing on developments, so it's almost always trying to stop a development in a local community, have either success or partial success. An example of that would be um, Turn to Harbour. Uh, here in Redlands near where I am campaigns that hasn't achieved success yet and it's still ongoing but it's those types of campaigns that actually have the greatest rates of success even though of course we can't make any causation claims between a campaign and an outcome. When we have enough data we can look at the associations and that's valuable too. When we look at who these campaigns target, campaigns targeting business here have the highest rates of success and partial success uh, so not campaigns targeting politicians. That's kind of I think pretty clear why as well. And the last kind of output we've had has been digital humanity outputs. There's an ArcGIS story map that you can see, which is about the climate change groups, campaigns and campaign outcomes. And then we've done a bunch of Twitter stories, just telling the story of different campaigns um, in the past in different parts of Australia. So that brings us to our final part of the presentation, which is the questions for discussion. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the presentation and I also hope that you like these questions, which I ponder quite a wee bit actually. The first one is, can citizen science be applied to the social sciences and what are the benefits and what are the pitfalls? And then the last one is, can citizen science itself be a form of advocacy or even civil resistance? Um, and again, noting that distinction between the action and the purpose of the action. So I hope those questions uh, bring up some interesting insights from you and I'm going to pass it back to Pat now to follow on. Thank you very much.